welcome back guys to the JPS podcast and this is a very special episode as it's the first episode where I interview in-house at JPS with our Director of Science, Lyndon Purcell. And after a lot of interest in what we do at JPS, especially with our physique and powerlifting athletes, we thought it would be a great opportunity to sit down and discuss our 2018 in review and some of the approaches with our athletes and the lessons we've learned. We discuss what it takes to get our athletes to a high level in both bodybuilding and powerlifting, what coaches uh, need to focus on when working with elite level athletes or trying to get their clients to reach their potential, how to address and manage client obstacles, and we also discuss some of our interesting case studies for 2018, as well as the changes in approach with our physique and powerlifting athletes this year in comparison to previous years. So I hope you guys really enjoy this episode. I'm sure those of you who are physique and powerlifting coaches or athletes will get a hell of a lot out of it. So without further ado, I introduce Lyndon Purcell. Welcome back guys to episode 54 of the JPS podcast and this is a very, very special episode of the podcast because it's our first in-house episode with the one and only former hot and dongerous. He deleted his Instagram handle because he has to focus on his studies, Lyndon Purcell. Welcome, Lyndon. How are you, Jacob? I'm very well, man. It's uh, interesting seeing you on a camera on a Monday morning and not at the studio, that's for sure. Yeah, well, you know, you've got to, got to branch out, got to try these things. Once everyone thumbs downs me and <laughs> abuses me in the comments, then, then we'll know not to do it again. <laughs> no, that's exactly right. And guys, for those of you who don't know, and you probably won't, uh, Lyndon is the Director of Science at JPS, so he does a lot of behind-the-scenes work, probably doesn't get as much airtime uh, as I do and some of our other coaches, but he's been a pivotal uh, part of the growth in JPS and development of our coaches and our practices and what we do. So in today's episode, uh, Lyndon and I wanted to chat about something that we've had a lot of interest in over the last few months and few years, and that's relating to uh, the coaching of both our physique and powerlifting athletes. And in today's episode, we're going to discuss our 2018 year in review for our athletes and give you an insight into our approaches uh, for both sports and some of the lessons we've learned. Uh, so I was doing some digging before uh, this podcast and reflecting over the last uh, 12 months and what our athletes have achieved and uh, where we're situated um, you know, as a company and how well or, you know, I guess, how important uh, it is for us as coaches to reflect and see uh, what we've done well and what we can improve. But 2018 was a milestone year for us. We've got four males in the top five in Australia in powerlifting, uh, four females in the top 10 in Australia. We've had uh, 15 first places in powerlifting at both local and uh, international and national level competitions. We've We've achieved uh, five pro cards on the physique stage. We've uh, collected 23 first place uh, titles in physique and 47 top five placings. So not too bad uh, for, for just a bunch of PTs. And uh, I guess Lyndon and I are going to be talking about uh, why we've seen a little bit of success today and what areas uh, you know we have done well and some of the things that we've learned along the way. And... More specific to our discussion today is going to be last weekend. So last weekend, uh, we had the Powerlifting Australia Nationals and the ICN uh, Nationals, which is the biggest federation for natural uh, physique in Australia. And we had uh, 14 competitors over two days competing, and we had six national records two national titles in the powerlifting. We got one pro card uh, with a title and also uh, 10 top fives in physique. So it was a crazy 48 hours. And I guess, uh, Lyndon, do you want to start us off the discussion uh, about the weekend and what you've seen uh, to be some of the reasons why we've been able to achieve uh, such a degree of success over the last 12, 18 months with our physique and powerlifters? Um, yeah, so it's, it's obviously 
super multifaceted. Um, like something that we discussed this week, um, I think a really underrated and underlying aspect of, of why JPS athletes are successful is simply the culture at JPS. Um, not only do, do clients, family, friends, and everyone come along and support. And I would say we, obviously I'm biased, um, but I would say we comprehensively have the loudest cheer squad at almost every event. Um, and I think that is, that is a, an underrated factor. Um, secondly is, uh, as we've attracted more and better athletes, this subconsciously pushes everyone else to be better. Like, I think that is one of the real, real benefits to in-person coaching while, while online coaching is expanding and improving and has kind of become the, the in thing of recent times, there is nothing quite like seeing, you know, Carl in the gym squat a weight that is just a monstrous amount of weight for someone, his body weight. Like, yeah, you can see these things on Instagram. You can watch YouTube videos of freaks like Jesse Norris and, you know, Mr. Atwood in the States. But until you see someone with just like brute force with the bar bending around their back, lifting a weight that they shouldn't, it, I don't think you realize just how possible it is. Like when you see something across the internet, you're like, yeah, that's, that's crazy. There's freaks out there. But when you meet a freak face to face, I think it, it really unlocks some possibilities of what you can actually achieve. Um, and I think this is something that Chad Wesley Smith speaks about a lot is just nothing will be better for your own training than going and training in a gym where people are better than you. Like you can be the most motivated person in the world with the best program, but if you're training at an anytime fitness or something like this, you know, the wolf climbing the hill is is not ah uh, sorry is hungrier than the wolf at the top sort of a thing. So I think they're two very underrated factors. Just like the two biggest factors, and this is from a very um very quick kind of analysis, and I'm not quite sure where I, you know, I'm not convinced on these two things, but I think the biggest things that go into it is one the expansion of knowledge that our coaches have had, like you have doubled, tripled, quadrupled in your knowledge since I've known you and, like, you already knew plenty when I knew you sort of a thing. Like, you are working so hard to get your athletes better results that they end up getting better results. And secondly um, is just the assistance that we've got from other knowledgeable coaches. Like, this is, again, something that you and I spoke about in person, but we had a number of coaches there on the weekends that were overseeing things when – you know, when you couldn't be there, I couldn't be there face to face. Like we had throughout the day, we had a really good idea of how everyone was doing when there was just infinite things going on around us. And if you've never been to a, a fitness expo like, you know, like that happened on last uh, last weekend or the weekend before, they're manic. Um, so, to, so to have really knowledgeable coaches being your eyes and ears, it goes a long way for – for building success on these kinds of weekends. Yeah. And you should tell everyone about your step count, sorry, as well, just to <laughs> just to put into context how crazy these kinds of weekends can be. Yeah, so for those of you who might be listening from across the shores, you'd probably be familiar with like the Arnold's Expo and things like that where they have mm-hmm. all the supplement stands and everyone in the industry goes and, you know, it, it's a big big event and this is uh what our nationals was it was held at a fitness expo and there were two uh stadiums next to each other uh, one with the powerlifting and one with the physique show going on and i was running frantically uh across the two for our 14 athletes and i racked up it was twenty seven thousand steps on day one and then i think i had uh 10 or twelve thousand. uh no sorry I think I ended up getting like 40 odd thousand over the weekend, but it was 27,000 on the first day. And I usually get three to 4,000 a day because I'm parked on my laptop or just, you know, moping about the gym floor. So yeah, it was chaos. And yeah, what I think you said, Lyndon, in regards to 
uh, you know, having many hands, making for light work, that couldn't be further from the truth. And as they say, you know, it takes a village to raise a child. And I think that can be said also for, for many of our athletes, you know, it hasn't been mm. just me, their coach or, you know, one of our coaching staff who's been responsible for their, their development. Um, you know, it's the entire JPS community. And I think that's something that a lot of, uh, athletes, as you mentioned, who work purely online for whatever reason, uh, can sometimes miss out on is that, uh, connection with other individuals and how, how important it is to to be connected with other athletes, coaches, and just people you know who care about or are in, interested in uh, your journey can make a huge difference uh, when you're trying to to get to the top. And I guess what I wanted to to discuss a little bit further, you know, in regards to our athletes and them, you know, having the success that they've had is more so how they got there because. You know, we haven't always had, you know, all these elite level athletes. Like we have literally built many of them from from the ground up. You know, um, mm. as an example, Sam, my brother, business partner, who uh, you coach, Lyndon, uh, he wasn't always the best in the country, and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a minute. But you know, what it takes to get an athlete to you know an advanced level or a very competitive level. Um, you know, in physique and powerlifting isn't just good training uh, and good nutrition advice. As, as you started to mention, it's, it's very much to do with um, the culture and the community and everything else that goes into it. Um, but let's discuss now what coaches uh, need to focus on when they're working with elite level athletes. What are some of the things that they should be trying to prioritize um, or be aware of when they're working with someone who has potential or if they're trying to get someone, uh, you know, to reach their potential and in the hopes of being elite. Mm, so I think, um, <clears throat> I think the most important thing is, is simply time. Like it's one of the most boring, boring things to kind of talk about, but staying injury free is just of fundamental importance if you want to be the best you possible. Like, yeah, so just not doing dumb shit in training, in all honesty. Like, and that was one of the the biggest things you mentioned, Sam, like that I came on board and tried to fix. Like Sam, you know, when I first was started coaching Sam, I turned my back and he was trying to do one-arm pull-ups and he would be doing, you know, a max overhead press and, you know, would worry – sorry, would wonder why he's beat up and sore and all kinds of things like that. So um, just keeping your athletes healthy. And that means as a coach, sometimes you need to be super scathing with yourself and and recognize if your clients are beat up, like you're probably doing something wrong to some degree. Like, again, it's very hard to speak about absolutes in this kind of territory, but <sighs> – if, yeah, if there's a theme of shoulder niggles and sore lower backs and things like that, maybe you've got some, yeah, some things to focus on for yourself. Like with powerlifting and, and bodybuilding, like they're, they're treacherous sports. They're, they're very hard and they're very taxing. Um, but I'm always a fan of, of looking within and internally. It's like, what could I possibly be doing wrong before you blame an athlete? Um, secondly, I would say is like, again, it's another boring one, but forget about, you know, the most optimized training, nutrition, supplements, things like that. If you have a poor understanding of firstly technique and secondly, if your athlete is not willing to apply themselves 100% pretty much to things outside of their training nutrition, like if they are not you know, going to sleep at a reasonable time and doing these kinds of things like, you know, the latest program and the most nuanced nutrition with higher low days, you know, all kinds of crap like this. If they're not yet yeah, being consistent with their sleep schedule, you know, getting fruit and veg in all kinds of things that just develop a healthy body, managing stress, then forget about it. Like, and again, that's, that's practices. I've really tried to drill into 
both my athletes and my gen pop clients. Like when I send out my pro form email or things like that, it's like, I'm not going to talk to you about technique, sleep, all this kind of, you know, day one stuff. You get that right. And then the rest of this stuff will just add on top and we'll be kicking goals. But if I have to ask you, oh, how much sleep are you getting? Oh, you know, four or five hours because I'm staying up watching Netflix. It's like, forget about it. It's like, don't waste my time or yours. Um, I'd be a, yeah. I'm a horrible Jim athlete. <laughs> yeah, we know that. <laughs> uh, yeah, so... I feel sorry for you, Brian. <laughs> so, yeah, I think when, when I'm working with someone and I'm looking to help them reach you know, their potential and it's a very nebulous word and it's, it's somewhat uh, ambiguous but you know I think we all have a pretty good understanding of what it means um, to be the best that they can be um, yeah I very much agree that time is a huge factor but what a lot of coaches and athletes need to realize is that it's not just time lifting it's time working with an individual and giving them enough time to to figure you out, um, you know, because I see so many uh, coaches looking to just, you know, work with someone for 12 months or, you know, six months. They can't keep their clients, you know, for extended periods of time. Um, and they have poor retention rates and they wonder why they never, you know, have athletes, you know, who are the cream of the crop in their given sport. Um, I think respecting the fact that it's an ongoing relationship and the best results occur, you know, after after years of working with someone. And, and that goes for athletes too. I think a lot of athletes are very much, you know, persuaded by the the, the social media um, yeah. and how you know, they always see that the grass is greener on the other side or that they feel like they're missing out or some coach out there has that bit of knowledge or that system or way of programming that's going to fast track their progress. When in reality, for the first few months, you know, at best, most coaches are simply guessing. And I think to reach an elite level, there needs to be a level of commitment uh, spoken about between both the coach and the athlete. Um, and an understanding of the process moving forward. Um, you know, it requires an off season, you know, if physique athletes yeah. want to sign up, uh, you know, for a coach 12 weeks out and expect to win a pro card, they're getting themselves. If they're working with the coach, you know, for years and years and years, well, yeah, expecting a pro card, it's a different story, you know, and, and there's a lot of genetic factors involved in there. Sure. But, you know, to, to have high expectations, you need to give the coach a, a realistic amount of time to to get it right, and obviously there is a lot of difference between you know coaches' knowledge and their skill sets, and sometimes you will outgrow a coach, or there might be other issues that arise, and you know, you need to change coach, and that's completely fine. But if you find someone who you gel with for the most part, um, they do a good job, they tick the basic boxes, and they have the experience, the knowledge, and you know some results to prove that they, they know how to get someone there, then you really have to stick it out. And I can use one of our athletes um, as an example, Vanessa. Um, you know, It was her first season, but she signed up with me to start her contest prep over 12 months out right and it gave us time to to really put in the foundational work and lay the bricks you know in the off season before going into the contest prep and it's something i'm really big on now is not just taking people on uh, at the beginning of a contest prep diet and she got some tremendous results and it was no surprise to me you know even in her first season she she won uh, pretty much every show that she competed in she had uh, 2 seconds and she won a pro card at nationals. So she absolutely killed it, but I wasn't really surprised because we had the time to, you know, to get the result. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, some clients who approach me, um, you know, at the start of a contest prep season, it's a lot of hard work. And the, the same goes uh, for powerlifting as well. You know, hiring a coach to, to do your prep isn't going to give them a hell of a lot of cha a chance to, to get it right the first time. And if you have a really crappy uh, outing on the platform first go around, it doesn't necessarily mean uh, you know they're a bad coach or they don't know what they're doing. Uh, it's just more so they haven't got time to, to get it right. So I think one of the biggest 
components of uh, becoming elite and being a successful athlete is respecting the coaching process and the ongoing commitment to the relationship that you're building with your coach. And that's something that we've uh, been able to do with a lot of our athletes. You know, I've worked with uh, one of our physique guys who uh, is absolutely phenomenal. He just missed out on a pro card, Michael Kamara. Um, you know, this is our third year running. Um, you know, that we've been working together both uh, in contest prep and in the off season. And, you know, he's got better and better and better every, every time he's gone on stage. And, you know, he's been able to go from somebody who missed out on, you know, winning uh, titles to, to now he cleans up titles, overalls, and, you know, he's, he's in contention for a pro card. And it, it takes time. And this is something we drill into our athletes is that if you want a quick fix and you want somebody to just coach you for 10 weeks, we're not interested. And I, th I think this is important, not just for athletes to realize, but also coaches, you know, have high standards and expectations of who you want to work with. Because if you do want to work with uh, top level guys, uh, you want to make sure that they have the right mindset um, and understanding of the process from the get go so that you know, after 12 weeks when, you know, you're still getting a handle on, you know, their recovery rates, you know, their, their nutritional intake and all these sorts of things, um, that they're not expecting the world from you. They're, they're understanding that, okay, we're still trying to find, you know, the groove, so to speak, and feel each other out. And, you know, there's going to be months and months and months, um, of work to do once, once we find that. Um, but yeah, I think that's something that we've successfully done with a lot of our athletes. Um, you know, yeah, I think all our guys who, who achieved some pretty, uh, pretty big results this year, I've been working with for 12 months or longer. Hmm. No, you, you're, you're a hundred percent right. Like, and you mentioned Michael and, you know, Mike is, Mike is such a loyal boy. Um, and it's going to pay off for him. Like, you know how he operates now. And <clears throat> this is something that it's a misconception that a lot of people have about the coaching process or they sort of, you know, they come to you and they feel like, oh, if I give you my weight, you know, my stats and, you know, my training numbers, why can't you write me the, the perfect program straight up? And as you and I both know all too well, um, coaching's an, an investigation process and, it's, you know, if you, if you think about it kind of like, you know, like a murder investigation or something like that, like that pro card might be catching the murderer at the end of it sort of a thing. But if every, you know, if every month or two you're putting a new detective on a case, then they've got to find all the same clues again. They've gone through over the same steps that the last three detectives have, have done. They get to the point in the, the case where it gets a little bit tricky and it, it takes some thinking and some you know, some cognitive ability and ability and some, some lateral moves. And then the, the athlete jumps, jumps coach again and feels like they're, they can't find the perfect coach. Whereas, you know, all it takes really is, is an adequate coach, a sufficient coach sort of thing that can just apply their own methodologies over time. Um, and this brings me to another, another factor I think that's really played into JPS's success is, and this is something we speak about um, in our mentoring kind of realms, like when we speak with, with other coaches and PTs and help them try and build successful careers for themselves is, is you've got to find a niche sort of a thing. Um, it doesn't have to be the most, you know, microscopic niche of 34 year old women with, you know, scoliosis and, you know, two kids, like it doesn't have to be that narrowed down, but we have slowly, over time attracted certain athletes because we work well with certain athletes. And then, you know, once you've worked with a certain type of athlete that needs certain types of things over time, you find all the best ways to, to fix those kinds of problems. Um, and while I couldn't exactly uh, describe or qualify what the exact JPS niche is, I, I think you would at least admit that a lot of our, successful athletes and clients and just people around the gym all exhibit certain quality and fuck i don't know <laughs> we just get them bigger and we just get them stronger like we, we don't let our power lifters be fat like mm. is that i don't know if this is supposed to be a secret or not but 
we work our athletes hard and they respect the decisions we make. Like, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree. And now let's talk about, uh, I guess, some of the case studies um, or the interesting uh, athletes that we've worked with uh, in the last, you know, 12 months and more. And we'll kick it off with uh, Sam, who we've been talking a little bit about uh, already, who is one of the most gifted athletes uh, that we have, but hasn't always been able to piece it together on the platform. Um, I'll give a little bit of a background uh, into Sam, and then you can get into mm. um, you know the programming side of things and how you tackled some of the obstacles that you faced with him. Uh, but Sam is my brother. Since growing up, um, he has had phenomenal relative strength. Like I remember as four- and five-year-olds, he could jump on the monkey bars and literally like pull himself up, do chin-ups by like the age of 10. Um, you know, when he started lifting, he could, he could bench pretty much the same as me with, with ease. And I was, you know, two years older and had been training for like, you know, double the time he had. And it really pissed me off and only made me work harder and harder and want to learn more and more because I never, I always wanted to stay one step ahead. Um, but he's been, uh, riddled with injuries, uh, you know, since, Pretty much the day he started lifting. Uh, unlike me, I'm quite robust. I, you know, literally don't break uh, mm. too easily. Sam, Sam breaks. You know, if he if he does, you know, an, a set or two more than what he should be doing, um, mm. and has been quite literally, uh, as the Instagram uh, account would describe, a frustrated athlete for um, for for years, for years now. He's yeah. had so much potential. Um, but you know, just his injuries have held him back, um, have riddled him with like self doubt, confidence issues. And I've never stepped in to coach him because it's just, it wouldn't end well. Um, and I, I've just sat back and watched over the years, his, uh, his journey just be curtailed with, um, frustration really and it's bothersome to me as his brother to to watch but there's only so much I could do about it. so I was really glad when uh you took over the helms uh last year and I knew that you'd have a, a pretty good understanding of all the information uh necessary through me you know discussions we'd had about Sam but uh yeah when you got Sam he he had beat up hips back shoulder you know a lot of potential but uh mm. Not a lot to, to say about it. So I guess talk to us about what you've done. And for those, again, who don't know, Sam uh, just set a national squat record in Australia uh, with 255 kilos at 77 kilos body weight in the 77 class. And he uh, set a new uh, total record, a national total record with 697.5 kilos. So almost a 700 total at 77. Um, and he won uh, open nationals. So... It was a good meet. How did you do it, Lyndon? Mm. How did you get in there? Yeah, so for starters, like I do want to credit um, like all the past coaches that, that Sam has had. Like, And this is, again, something we, we try and highlight a lot. Like, Just because a coach gets a good result with you, like, don't discount all the work that went in before that. Um, so, But I took over Sam's coaching, yeah, it, I think it was December. So it, it's just coming up in about 12 months. Um, and yeah, shit, the, the start of it, um, <laughs> it was a whirlwind. Like I, for, for the starters, like I gave him the hard chat, like which we, we do recommend. Um, it's like, I don't want you to waste my time. Like I think you have potential, but if you're going to disrespect me by going off program, doing dumb things, you know, not weighing yourself consistently, like, you know, find another coach. Like just because Sam and I are friends, I wasn't going to be dicked around in that regard. And to his credit, he w he's been more than respectful and I think he's reaping the reward rewards for it now. Um, but yeah, it, it started off horribly. We had our first meet together in March. Um, and I had, I hadn't understood Sam's body yet. I, um, personally as a coach, I had a bad meet and bad, made some bad calls. Um, we went for a deadlift record, that I shouldn't have. Um, I shouldn't have let him do that. And, and as I said, yeah, that, that was my mistake. So Sam ended up pulling up a little bit sore from, from the meat. Um, and he just, there was lots of things going on in his life at the time, but he ended up 
hurting his back and then being diagnosed with shingles, like all within a period of time. And basically, yeah, he, he was in a bad way. So that, that lingered for a while and we, we slowly rehabbed him. We slowly got him healthy. I learned things. We got on top of him. Um, but no, yeah, no less than, or sorry, no more than five months ago or whatever I'm trying to say, he was still only squatting the bar. Like in the back of my mind, I was like, I'm going to get this kid to win nationals. I can do this. I want it for him. I want it for myself. I want it for JPS. Um, but yeah, that, that was a very, um, scary time. You know, when you've got such a, such a strong athlete who couldn't even squat the bar to depth. Um, yeah, that was testing. But what we did, we ended up doing a bench only comp, um, improved his bench press, set a bench press PB. And we worked on that while we rehabbed his squat and we, we rehabbed his deadlift and we, we improved technique over time. And as you said, Sam has, Sam is very strong, but he's been a horrible competitor. It doesn't matter how strong you are in the gym. It doesn't matter how strong you are the day after comp or the day before or anything like that. We had to get some runs on the board. So, uh, at our stre- at strength cultures comp, um, we worried about Sam just going nine from nine. He ended up setting a, uh, or equaling his total PB um, at, at they were all his lifts for like RPE seven, just because he'd never hit consistent you know nine from nine to build that total before, and this was all coming off a lot of uh, a lot of volume work. So what we'd done is I knew Sam had to lift heavy weights for a pretty long time going into nationals, but we had to buy up that recovery time and. We had to had to build a large amount of work capacity, sort of prior to that. So he competed um, in not fully peaked states, and which is something um, that I know you're big on as well. Is not every comp should be an all out, you know, peak to the max kind of a thing. We just got some comp experience, and and it was basically like basically a testing day after a volume block, um, and then going into nationals. It was it was the same kind of same kind of thing. It's like we'd we'd squatted all or sorry, we'd lifted all those weights pretty much up until training. Um I didn't wanna a lot of sorry, a lot of coaches kind of I think rely maybe too much on what they can get out of a taper. Like, oh, you know, once they taper they'll be ten, fifteen percent stronger. Whereas like I didn't want to take any risks like that on the day. I worked out the numbers he had to get up to in training. And then we were just going to do it fresher on the day. And once we got that squat out of the way, that 255, his bench press was like absurdly easy. So Sammy benched 160 at like he almost threw the bar through the roof. And same with his deadlift at, at 282. Um, he picked it up and was fine. Like he could have he could have had that 700 total easily, I think. But that we weren't going in there for for glory, for records, anything like that. We knew he'd probably take the squat record, but we were going in there to put on, just to make everyone chase us. We knew if Sam lifted some heavy weights, everyone would be behind the eight ball pretty quickly, and that's how it played out. So I think just having a really long-term kind of view on these things, like it, it can be really easily to get caught up in doing a good job at a local meet or something like that. But if you're coaching a genuinely gifted athlete, they've only got to be their best a couple of times a year, like at a national and international level sort of a thing. And people were saying to us, um, you know, backstage warming up at strength culture and things like that. It's like, Oh, increase his weight. Like what's he doing? This is, this is easy. And I just tell Sam to go and sit in the corner, face the wall and block it out. Like that was threatening to everyone. I could see it was a worry that, fuck, it was like if Sam becomes a good competitor, mm. we're all in strife because that that was just why people beat him in the past. He's super strong, but he bombs. So, yeah, I think I think that's my semi-ramble on that. And just we, I think I mentioned, but we improved technique over time. Like, as you said, he's been gifted since a child. He never appreciated technique and strength to the same level that he should. Like, I've, I've really drilled into him. He's got to respect strength. Like, you don't just – because half the time he could walk into a gym and squat 230 kilos without even a warm-up. Like, he's stupid like that. 
And I was like, no way. You've got to show me that you can own 227. You know, then you can have 230. Once you've owned 230, I'll give you 232. And just those incremental work over time, yeah, brings good results. Yeah. No, I, I couldn't agree more. Respecting strength is huge. And I guess I'll talk about uh, Carl now as that was a perfect segue uh, into s- discussions around Carl. So for those of you listening, Carl is one of uh, our coaches at JPS and he's also uh, one of the strongest and craziest uh, pricks that I know. <laughs> um, in the last... Uh, so I've been working with Carl uh, since 2017, so nearly two years now. Um, and we started working together because he had the, uh, crazy goal of being a dual athlete competing in both physique and powerlifting, but not in, uh, separate years, uh, in the same weekend. And, uh, we did it. We did it. We, uh, did it successfully. He placed, uh, top three in physique nationals and 24 hours prior set a national squat record and won open nationals in the 66 kilo class. And then we've repeated a similar feat this year, albeit separate months. He uh, came third in a physique show and uh, also won open nationals uh, two weekends ago where he had his uh, best meet to date um, and yeah, set a new squat record uh, in the 69 kilo class now in powerlifting Australia with uh, 240 a 132.5 bench and a 262.5 deadlift with a new total uh, record of 200 and uh, what was it? 35, uh, 635 kilos, I think it was. But anyway, uh, Carl was an interesting athlete, similar to Sam. Uh, a lot of injuries, naturally strong boy, didn't really respect uh, his strength or the importance of technique. He's very much, um, you know, a grip and grip and rip kind of guy um he goes in there uh he gets dark if for anyone who has seen carl uh, psych himself up pre-lift he goes into a very dark place and i've seen him pass out many times because he gets uh so wound up and that was definitely something we had to address was just his uh attitude towards lifting and that not every session and every lift uh needed to be balls to the ball uh you know with serious amounts of hype so learning how to contain the animal within carl was something that we really focused on uh for a long period of time and similar to sam uh you know picking picking his battles picking his moments when Mm -hmm. he would uh you you know, go all out and have meets where, you know, we push the limits and see what he's capable of, but also having meets where we just get practice, practice competing. Because when I took over uh, from uh, Andrew Tang, who was Carl's previous coach, um, you know, Carl came on off the back of a, quite a successful meet at Worlds, um, but he'd had a few average meets uh, by Carl's standards going going into Worlds. Um, you know, he just just missed a couple of lifts, due to silly stuff um and i could see that it was starting to affect his confidence so with carl it's very much about building that confidence in the meets that didn't really matter as much um you know so we set out i think it was um the first meet we did together was nationals after worlds um but that was yeah a one-off occasion but after that you know i taught carl that he has to have meets where he competes sub maximally and doesn't you know throw it all out there and we did that quite well um and he handled himself you know to his credit um tremendously well and you know that was his uh first ever sub maximal meet where he went uh i think we had eight from nine um he missed one lift just due to a misgroove um he was learning how to sumo deadlift um you know just another tweak that i made to try and preserve his lower back because he had a history of lower back injuries and and it, it did the job he's been pain free now since we started working together and pulling up really well um you know both into meets and you know post competition which is fantastic but again after that meet you know we we set our sights on resetting um his record in the squat which we did um and then also um you know trying to improve his other lifts and we and we did that but Carl's prep uh, going into nationals was really interesting, and I guess what what the uh, take home message is to a lot of lifters uh, here is that you don't lose strength by taking a break. 
Um, mm. you, you're not going to go that far backwards if you take some time off. In fact, it's probably going to make you a better lifter. Uh, so Carl went to Europe for for six weeks and did some training, but not a hell of a lot. He didn't train for the last three weeks of the trip. Um, Mykonos got the better of him. But when he came back, we had six weeks until nationals. So we had six weeks uh, to prepare and pretty much start from scratch. So he was lifting pretty submaximally for the first uh, four weeks. And it was a very slow introduction into the heavy stuff with quite aggressive uh, peak where two weeks, uh, you know, we dropped the volume quite a bit and I just worked him up to an RP9. Um and it worked tremendously well, and he went out and s- squatted 240 kilos at, 60, at 69 kilos, which is 3.48 times body weight, so his best squat to date. Um, and I, I dare say the second biggest male squat in Australia uh, that I'm aware of, second behind Nathan Tannis, um, who squatted, I think it was like 300 at 83 kilos, something stupid like that. Um, yeah. <laughs> so... So to take someone who is already really fucking strong and already elite and make them better um, is tough. And it's something that I rack my brain about when I put together Carl's programs, when I'm thinking about him as a lifter. But the improvements have come uh, not through any magical programming as evidence by a six-week prep. Um, It's just more so teaching him how to look after his body how to you know just fine tune his technique under certain loads, um, you know, and more importantly, timing uh, when we you know have the meets where we push uh, versus when it's time to pull back and you know have more variation, um, you know, put the barbell away for a little bit, uh, build some muscle, and you know give the joints a bit of a spell. I think a lot of powerlifters um, get married. To their lifts and it's their demise and it's it's hard it can be hard for a coach and an athlete to take a month two months away from low bar squatting comp pressing and you know competition deadlifts it's not the easiest thing to convince an athlete who's been uh competing for a long time seen a lot of success with you know their approach to pull away from uh, the big lifts and spend some time developing other qualities um, you know, and yeah, giving their body a rest. But I was very surprised. I was surprised, but I wasn't surprised when Carl came back after six weeks and performed so well. I wasn't surprised because I knew that he, he, he was the first time he took any time off training for like five years. Um, <clears throat> And he needed it, and I knew that it was only going to do him, you know, the world of good to give his joints a bit of a break and to come back hungry and ready to lift, um, because that's one of the biggest issues with most powerlifters uh, is the burnout. Because performing three lifts is really tedious and arduous work, and you know, variation and time off uh, it can be very uh, refreshing, and that I knew that it it would work in our favor in that regard. But I was also very surprised because. You never know, um, you know, when you've got such a short time frame uh, to work with and you're coming back uh, from some time off, you never know how the athlete's going to respond. Um, but to Carl's credit, he did everything necessary and we, we got the results in the end. Yeah, I, th- I think um, you highlighted some, some brilliant points there. Like when it when you are dealing with if you want to maximize the success of your athletes, I think as a coach, you really must inherit their insecurities. Like you cannot ha- let an elite athlete have insecurities sort of a thing. Like if they're, and this, and this just comes back to gen pop clients and things like that as well. Like if you are, if you can't go through six weeks of, of a volume block without needing to test your, you know, your one RM squat bench and dead, like, I'm sorry, but you are seriously, undermining yourself from a programming perspective and from just a psychological perspective like as you said we we've, we've really needed to to break through to some degree with these guys it's like man if you spend 8 12 16 weeks away from the big lifts but you know you're pumping some volume growing some muscle like shit it'll come back quick and it'll come back with a vengeance and before you know it you'll be you'll be your best ever so if yeah if you can't take time off or you can't get away from stage shape or, mm. 
or the big three for heavy lifts, like, yeah, like don't bother. You're not going to be the best you'll ever be. You need to, and as an athlete, that's, uh, yeah, I truly think that's the coach's job to inherit those insecurities. Like they've got to convince you, you don't have to worry about it. And as a coach, you need to be like, so confident in your abilities that you can deal with them. Like, yeah, if, if you're insecure as a coach and you're you're worried about, oh, fuck, are my clients and my athletes making progress so that you've got to test them every six weeks or so, like, again, you're you're not going to maximize the outcomes. Mm. And that, that ties in perfectly to, to the next athlete uh, that we had on the chopping block here. Uh, which is big MK who we spoke about. So Michael mm. is the Liberian gift. He, uh, he's got some of them BBC genetics, but he's one of the hardest working, uh, you know, folks that I, I've ever seen. You know, the man will literally run through a brick wall if I told him that it would help him, you know, get into contest shape. But one of his biggest insecurities uh, going into a show uh, has been pulling back on training uh, pulling back on the cardio and eating mm. more food. Michael will not take a rest day, um, you know, unless I tell him. He, he's a freak in that regard. He's wired. He's the CEO of. He's the CEO of Team Team No Days Off and no, hashtag Growth. Like he is, he's the man. <laughs> literally, Michael is phenomenal. Like the way he's put together, both physically and mentally, not a lot of people can understand. And you know, in our first uh, season together, I sort of just let him let him go because I, I, I didn't want to tamper with, you know, the athlete too much. I thought I want to come in and, you know, get him a better result, but I didn't want to completely overhaul the, the approach to, you know, make him doubt me. I wanted him to have enough confidence uh, in what I was doing, but, you know, not draw too many uh, questions around things because, you know, obviously education is a very uh, ongoing process. And, and at the start, I just wanted to, I guess, drip feed my approach uh, into how he was going about things without completely just going, no, 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 this is how we do it. And then him looking at it and going, well, this is not what got me here in the first place, so fuck this. Yeah. Um, which is which is one of the real uh, issues with working with elite athletes is, you know, you do have to slowly modify their thinking, their programming, uh, especially if they come to you with a degree of success uh, prior because, you know, they'll always look to their experiences and go, well, this got me here, so... Why is this necessarily going to you know, make any difference? And sometimes uh, they can question that. But anyway, Michael's insecurities, uh, you know, very much surrounded rest and recovery um, because if he wasn't working hard, well, he wasn't doing enough. Um, and that's, you know, something I think every coach should definitely try to nurture in an athlete is, you know, that hard work and keep that around. You don't want your clients slacking off. Uh, or your athletes, you know, getting comfortable or lazy, but at the same time, you know, that can be their biggest downfall. Um, so we had to really monitor that, you know, and this prep, um, he went one better. He, he embraced my advice to rest more, you know, into the weeks coming into the show to taper down his cardio and to eat more food. So Michael traditionally, he used to cheat on his diet, uh, you know, going into shows by not having his refeeds. And I would only find this shit out after the fact. I'm like, dude, fucking eat your calves. You need to fill out. Mm. He'd, he'd look great. And because he was so big already, um, you know, he'd get away with it. And again, getting away with it, um, you know, just reaffirms to the athlete sometimes that, hey, you know, I was right. You know, I didn't have those carbs and, and I won. So, you know, I did the right thing there. Whereas they, they could have got a better result if they had have listened. Um and to his credit, this year, Michael really embraced that and he just got better and better and better show after show. And it made the world of difference. You know, he was it was taking a couple of days off in his, uh, you know, final week before a show. Uh, he was tapering his cardio down, which we know has, you know, profound effects in just, you know, stress uh, management and reduction, which can have a host of benefits in, you know, water retention and things like that. And he ate into the shows, which was... Uh, really impressive, and he looked fuller and harder than ever. Um, and as a result, he won, um, you know, some of the biggest shows uh, that we set out to achieve uh, some success in this year, which was fantastic. And I guess that brings me to another 
point that I wanted to discuss when you're working with someone, uh, you know, who's quite talented is how to manage their expectations. Because although we've spoken about uh, the success of JPS and I guess how well we've done, you know, this, this discussion today wasn't just to be about, um, you know, how good we are, but also, you know, some of the areas we wanted to improve as coaches and some of the shortcomings of um, us as coaches, our competitors and the happenings of the year. So, Michael uh, wanted his pro card this year. That was the goal. And although he's very talented and he's definitely capable um, of attaining a pro card, he, you know, if you see him, you'd be surprised that he doesn't have his pro card already. Um, you know, we fell short this year. We didn't quite, uh, quite get it. And that was tough. Like we flew to Sydney, uh, Michael and I, to compete. And you know, it, was, it was funny going into a meet, a uh, show, sorry, uh, as the favorite, I guess, and having this ex- expectation of cool, we're going here to to get the pro card, and you know we'll come back victors. And you know, in my head, I, I wasn't really concerned or or worried. But fuck, when he didn't win the overall, when he came second in the overall and didn't get his pro card, my jaw nearly hit the floor. He looked at me, and to again his credit, he handled himself like a champ on stage um, and was very respectful to both the other competitors in the sport, but. When he came off, man, was fuck. I I didn't know what to say, um, mm-hmm. you know. And managing his expectations going in, I I didn't, you know, pump up his tires too much, or I didn't, you know, say say to him that it's a sure thing. You know, I'm always very careful in you know telling my competitors that when we compete, you know, we just want to get better. We want to be better than our last time on stage. You know, let the judges take care of the the outcome. That's not why we compete. Um, you know, over time, if you get better and better, the results will start falling in your favor. So I tried to do my best in that regard, not to get too caught up on, on the results. Um, but when he came off, you know, managing, uh, his expectations and the disappointment that comes with, uh, falling short as an elite level athlete, um, you know, whether it's not getting your pro card or potentially, you know, missing a lift, missing a record, um, you know, not placing, uh, you know, as you thought you should, whatever the case may be, um, was something that I wasn't quite prepared for. And, you know, we sat on the plane, uh, on the way home at the airport, sorry. And on the way home. So we had, (laughs) we literally finished the the comp at 4 PM and our flight was at 8 30 PM. So we drove to the airport, which was an hour drive. And then we're at the airport for like three and a half hours before our flight. And then we had an hour flight home together. So I had like five and a half, nearly six hours with Michael, um, you know, just not knowing what to say, looking at each other and, you know, just this, just the elephant in the room at times and this horrible feeling of what the fuck just happened, you know, mm. why, you know, obviously in bodybuilding, such a subjective sport, you never know, um, you know, we're questioning ourselves, the the process, we're questioning, you know, the other athletes, there's just so much, um, you know, doubt and uncertainty um, that came to surface and it, it was really tough, you know, Michael didn't want to compete the following weekend, um, you know, which was for another pro card, he was like, I'm done. He was just so disappointed and upset, um, you know, that he fell short. And as a coach, you know, you need to be able to to manage that. And something that I, you know, spoke to Michael about was, you know, elite level athletes aren't always going to win. You know, there's always someone better than you. Um, and especially in bodybuilding with, you know, the judges, scoring you based on their opinion, not some objective measure that you never know. You never truly know uh, what they're looking for. You can only hope to put up your best every time and, you know, keep moving forward. But some of the discussions we had, I think, will be really useful to other athletes and coaches listening. Uh, we we spoke about how after every competition, you have two choices. One is you can, uh, depending on the result, you can sook, complain, and, you know, be upset, disappointed, and have all these emotions, which I think is important if you, if you don't get the result you expect. You can feel emotions. You can be human. That's completely fine. If you win, you obviously have the opposite of those feelings. But what's important is not whether you have those feelings or not, but it's the duration that you let them uh, manifest 
and you experience them because that will ultimately determine the direction that things start taking after that. For example, I told Michael, I said, man, I want you to feel everything that you're feeling right now. Tonight, I want you to feel it. I want you to feel it tomorrow. But as of Monday, you need to fucking drop it and you need to move forward and you need to adopt you know, that athlete mindset again of putting the work and focusing on the process and not looking back any further. And I think that's the coach's job is to look back and go, why did this happen? What can we do better? And really be reflective in uh, assessing and critiquing uh, everything that happened leading up to the day. Whereas the athlete, I think, needs to really monitor uh, the time they spend thinking about their previous performances, especially if they have another competition in close proximity, which is what Michael did. And the discussion, uh, you know, was very much, um, you know, dude, Monday, I need you to drop it. He didn't want to compete the following weekend. And I said, I want you to feel everything you're feeling for the next 48 hours. That's completely fine. Um, But on Monday morning, I want you to text me whether or not you want to do it. Choice is completely yours. I'm not going to force you to compete. Um, I'll support whatever decision you make, but just know that you know this is your final show of 2018, um, and you know you've put in fucking years, your almost your entire life into working for this moment, um, and giving up would be a shame. And I would love to see you compete, but I'll let you make the decision. And he texts me Monday morning, "Let's do it, coach." <laughs> and you know, I think. That that was really hard. That was something that I wasn't prepared for as a coach was to just manage disappointment and to you know I've managed disappointment, but on a much lesser scale. You know, you have yeah. a comp- you have a competitor miss a lift, you know, at a local meet, and say, like, oh fuck, you know, bad luck. Next one, you'll get it next meet. But you know, going for a pro card like as a bodybuilder, you know, that's that's an occasion that comes around, you know, fucking not, not very often. Um, Mm. and especially when Michael, you know, for example, has been working hard at this since he was like 16, uh, you know, Michael's, you know, almost, almost 30 now. So long time in the making. And funnily enough, I had the exact same experience as a coach, literally less than 12 hours later. I, I flew back to Melbourne on the Saturday night and the Sunday morning, uh, my little sister, Mia, uh, who's an absolute gun powerlifter, junior powerlifter. She's uh, now in the open uh, powerlifting class, but she was a junior. Um, she'd been working for three years um, in powerlifting on, on her squat uh, to, to chase down the junior squat record. So a bit of background on Mia. Um, she started training with me when she was, it was was like 16, but she dicked around and didn't like lifting weights for so long, had hip issues, all the rest of it. I taught her how to squat and in her first meet squatted 90 kilos, uh, in the 72 kilo class and then fell in love with powerlifting. Her three year powerlifting career progressed and, you know, she, Again, just fell short at nationals. Uh, you know, she came second at nationals, and she was you know nearing uh, the national squat record. And we said we'd have a crack at it for one last time. You know, in the final meet of 2018 before she goes into the open class. Uh, so we did. But and this was literally 12 hours after I got back uh, from Sydney with Michael, and we went out there. Warm ups moved brilliantly. Opening squat was exactly how I expected it to move. Her second attempt was perfect. Um, And her third attempt, which was for the record attempt, uh, you know, she got out of the hole, just above the hole. The hip shot up a little bit and, you know, it was game over and she missed it. And I was devastated. You know, we'd been working, like she said to me, literally after her first meet, I want to get the squat record. Even though she was like 60 kilos behind the squat record at that time, I said, fuck yeah, let's do it. And we committed over a three-year period uh, to working towards this squat record. And we finally got our shot at it. We got her to a position where she was capable of taking it. And, you know, she missed her third attempt of 163.5 kilos, uh, you know, just. And I was like, fuck, I'm the shittest coach in the world. Twice in 24 hours, I've had, you know, two of my athletes, you know, not, not achieve what we set out to achieve. And... Yeah, I had the same conversation uh, that I had with Michael. And more importantly, we didn't have seven days to turn it around. You know, I still wanted her to compete. We had to turn it around within 20 minutes before she went out for her next bench press. 
And again, I think the time frame that you let these things uh, consume you and affect uh, you know, your thought processes and decision making as an athlete is super important and needs to be really, really quick, especially if you've got to compete, um, you know, again, in another lift uh, in 20 minutes or, you know, you've got to go out for your third attempt, whatever the case may be, um, or as a physique athlete, when you're in the middle of a season, um, you need to be able to, to drop the emotions associated with, um, you know, failing or falling short, whatever terminology you want to use and let the coach worry about it. So, yeah, that was a very interesting weekend this season for me. And as a coach, I'm really glad it happened because it made me hungry. You know, I think I've had every record attempt I've gone for, I've hit uh, with my clients um, to date. You know, I think I've got over 15 national records, a couple of international records, um, and I've never fallen short yet. And that was the first one, and and it hurt. Um, I've also, you know, gone... I think five from five uh, pro cards uh, last year. And to miss this one, uh, you know, that was the first one that really missed that we, we, we didn't get the, uh, the cake. So these experiences this year, although there was a lot of success, these two um, very significant shortcomings in my athletes performance, um, I think will make me a better coach and make them better athletes. And I think, it's not spoken about enough. Every coach wants to tell you about all their success. And I think people look to the success as, um, you know, means of guidance and, you know, for information or an idea as to how to get there. And that's really important, no doubt. But I also think all the shortcomings that a coach experiences make them successful. Um, and they're the ones you can really learn from. You don't, you don't learn much from your success. And I told this uh, to Michael and Mia, I said, you know, when you when you fall short, it hurts, and it hurts so much that you learn and grow so much from that. Um, when you succeed, you just think you're a fucking hero, and you learn nothing. And these were definitely experiences that are going to make me a better coach, and they've forced me to really, really uh, think long and hard about things I could have done better. Like even with Mia, she weighed in 69 kilos and I told her, and you know, I haven't monitored Mia's nutrition uh, super tightly because uh, she always sits around 71 kilos, which is right at her weight class. Um, But she dropped two kilos in the last week and didn't fucking tell me. And I was like, holy shit, like you idiot. Why didn't you fucking, you know, granted I was busy and you know, it's my sister and I thought she was capable of just maintaining her weight, but she, you know, obviously panicked and ate a little bit less in the final week and, you know, woke up on the day like super light and I was just like, fuck, I could have stepped in. I could have been a better mm-hmm. coach. I could have done more, um, you know, and even with Michael, there's, you know, I was thinking back on things I could have done better. But again, I think it's important for coaches to discuss uh, their shortcomings and the experiences they have, which are not as uh, ex- exciting or Don't make the highlight real um, because they're the ones that provide the greatest opportunity for development. And, yeah, that were two that that really fucking hit me in the feels this year. It's, yeah, like, as you said, it will make you a better coach though. And, man, like, I would like to be an athlete on your list right now because I know you'll come back bigger and better from this. Um, and, And as I sort of, I touched on, with or for, for for starters, like man, like it is it is extremely disappointing for for Michael and Mia because they are two of the the loveliest people that I know. Um, they're you know they're some JPS favorites and they deserve all the spoils and success in the world. Like, so it is disappointing, but they should know that seriously. Like everyone at JPS is behind them, and we all can't wait to see them, you know, come back bigger and better from this. But as you said, like, yeah, it doesn't always go to plan. And, and like when I had that, that shocking meet with Sam, um, in March, like it's a big ego check and you can go, yeah, one of two ways. Like I was like, man, Sam has asked me to, to take over his coaching and take him to the next level. And I have just dropped him back miles, (laughs) you know, like he, he missed a 142 bench press on the day. Like, 
I was like, you could, what are you doing? Like, and I just made a horrible call after horrible call. And you're just like, it's, yeah, man, do I actually know what I'm talking about? Mm. And you do have to look within and you find some things that shouldn't be there and you, you turf them out real quick. And, and most of mine were, were very ego related. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Coaches, uh, can definitely get an ego and sometimes we need these, uh, ego checks. And a lot of the time, as you mentioned very, uh, early on in this, uh, episode, you know, coaches are too quick to turn the focus externally and blame everything else. Are the refs or the judges or the, you know, the athletes, everything they can. Whereas I've, I've made a habit of, you know, when shit goes south, turn your gaze inwards. You know, don't focus on uh, the athlete. Don't don't worry about the the judges, the referees. Uh, you know, any ex, you know external factors. Focus on what you're doing and what you can control or you could have controlled better. Um, and yeah, that's definitely what I'll uh, be doing moving forward. But moving on, I think uh, yeah, we should talk about some of the changes in approach that we've had. So. Uh, yeah, we'll kick off with our physique athletes and some of the things we've done differently in the past you know, 12, 24 months to, to previous years. And I'll kick off with, uh, with something a little bit abstract that many coaches probably don't think about or they've thought about but don't actually do, and that's uh, social media monitoring. So what, I've, mm. what I did with my uh, physique athletes this season in particular was... I tightly monitored their use and content on social media. And I think this is something that any of you out there, if you're an athlete or a coach uh, in physique sports, you should fucking be monitoring your social media use. Um, You know, I was watching my athletes, you know, how frequently they were posting food, uh, what types of foods they were eating, you know, just the words they were using, you know, in describing their body, you know, all of these sorts of things. And I, I use that as information to have conversations with my clients, um, you know, about their, you know, frequent uh, use of social media, um, probably in, a, in an incorrect manner. And also in terms of their comparison to others on social media, you know, competitors have a habit of finding out who's competing or they already know who they're competing against. So they'll, you know, look them up and they'll, you know, see where they're at and compare their journey and their physique to competitors. And sometimes that's useful. Um, but in many cases it's not. So something I did this year was I obviously added all my uh, clients on social media and I would do my best to, to jump on, check their stories, check their uh, posts. And if I saw anything that uh, I guess was not to my liking or particularly concerning, uh, you know, whether they weren't eating, uh, you know, high volume foods or they were just having too much flexibility in their diet or whatever the case may have been at the time, you know, as it related to their plan and what they needed to be doing, um, you know, in accordance with their plan, I would, you know, send them a message and say, Hey, give me a call, you know, or, you know, flick me a text when you're free and I'll buzz you. And it was really useful. Like I had some clients who were, you know, uh, making all sorts of delicious meals, you know, fitting it in their calories, Mm -hmm. you know, but making all these delicious meals and they're like, you know, a month or two out. I'm like, all right, dude, I know you can get away with this and I know you're not really hungry now. Um, you know, and I know you're, you're feeling good, you're looking good, but I think you should probably taper down on, you know, the loaded fries and, you know, the homemade loaded fries and the, you know, freaking 20 different items in your cereal fucking, you know, I, I want you to keep it simple. And it was really useful. And I think mm. as coaches, like, fuck, social media is so powerful to get an insight into your clients' lives and, you know, there's a there's a fine line between you know intruding and becoming uh you know a pervert in, in a sense and you know voyage of you know somebody else's life but i think as coaches it can give us so much information um you know you can see how your clients are feeling like my clients would say things like you know oh tired and they'd use negative language or things like this and i'd you know message them say hey man you know just remember that your words become a reality like you need to you know try to stay positive and you know make sure that your choice of words uh, you know is what you want your world to become and not <laughs> you know necessarily always you know talking about how you're feeling and 
and things like that. I could monitor their relationships, like, you know, all these sorts of shit. Like if I see my client, you know, making meal with their partner or, you know, having some downtime with their partner, I'd message them and say, dude, that's awesome. Keep that up. Like, you know, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. If they're getting in their, you know, steps, you know, when it was cold and, you know, miserable weather, I'd say, dude, you're crushing it. You know, keep focus. Like, you know, I could offer some, you know, reinforcement for those positive behaviors also. So it wasn't always, you know, hey, what are you doing wrong? You know, how can I fucking, you know, drill you and, you know, make your life harder, so to speak. Um, it was more so how can I just monitor their behaviors and, and their mindset uh, towards the approach um, to improve things or to, to keep the good things going. So that was really useful this year. And so too was uh, counting step count. Um, so instead of the typical approach, which I'd use, I'd use step count um, and daily steps a little bit last year with some of my uh, athletes who were a little more, um, you know, quantitative focused, you know, they, they like the numbers and I knew they'd take well to that kind of approach. But this year I made all my physique athletes track their steps and holy shit, did I learn some interesting things about human physiology? Um, and just, yeah, how important, uh, keeping your step count consistent, uh, is, you know, during contest prep, because there was some big drops, um, you know, when when body fat and body weights and calorie intake were getting low you know there were days where clients would get some seriously low steps um and without having that prompting or that's the, the plan calling for a certain step target they would definitely not have got it um and even if they had have done their cardio it wouldn't have made up the difference so that was really useful uh this year as well anything else that you saw don uh that we did with our physique guys um, uh, yeah, so I, I probably will just speak to two points a little more broadly that I think apply to both, um, both our powerlifters and our physique athletes, but you kind of, the first thing you mentioned was, was Michael's, um, so like fear of rest. And this is something that I think is as, you know, as a physiology nerd, like I think it's super apparent when you understand physiology, but maybe maybe not once it kind of filters back to the practicality of coaching is like as an athlete gets closer and closer to their potential. And as you start working with, you know, elite athletes, they have to spend, you know, more uh, focus and intense kind of periods of when they're doing it hard, they're doing it fucking hard. Like, and I know this is an approach that you've used um, before as well. Um, and it, again, it kind of depends on on the context, obviously. Like when you're sort of just trying to get Carl back to around his best, it doesn't have to be, you know, hard all the time. Like, as you said, he came back from a holiday um, and some time off and you knew he had that strength still there. So it was just it could be up a bit, down a bit, up a bit, down a bit sort of a thing. But if you're trying to, you know, if you're really trying to improve the amount of muscle mass, um, you know, an elite bodybuilder has or trying to bring up, you know, your client's squat, which is already amazingly good. Like, I think this is where auto regulation and things like that and rest can all muddy the water a bit. It's like if you're going to go through a squat cycle and try and put 10 kilos on you know your clients your client squat or something like that then they should be doing extended rest sort of before and after but then going balls to the wall when you're doing it like adaptation gets harder and harder to generate as you just get closer and closer to the genetic potential so yeah you really need to stress the physiology and this kind of ties into my sort of second point is because of how difficult adaptation is, you need to you need to have all the all the odds kind of stacked in your favor. And I was chatting to um to Charlie about this, Charlie from Strength Culture about this backstage um at Nationals, and he was saying just sort of how much better all these lifts are going 
now that he's just doing something as simple as tracking his nutrition and making sure he's getting in enough calories and protein each day. And I was like, dude, that's fantastic. Like for starters, you're an awesome dude. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that your lifts are going well. But as a physiology nerd, I was kind of like, you know, fucking shit. Like you're a strong dude, like, and your body will find any excuse not to adapt. Like you could have smashed all your training sessions, you know, Monday to Friday sort of a thing. But then you just, you sleep in a little bit late on a Saturday and don't get enough food in and go to bed a bit late that night. And your body is like, Oh, there's an excuse where I don't have to adapt. So, you know, you, this really requires forethought from a coaching perspective. Um, and if we're, yeah, we're speaking about elite athletes specifically, you need to have them rested, repaired, and just ready to go. If you're going to push their lifts, um, you know, focus on something or, focus on reaching a new level of muscularity or something like that. And then you've got to stay on top of them of providing the resources, like dropping weight into a meat is something that I'm just, yeah. And, and this is not directed at me or something like that. Like, but yeah, cutting weight into meat, like to me is just something that I'm really not big on. Um, you know, so I, I've, I've got to try and make sure that all my athletes are at around their weight, like, you know, three or four months out and then they can supply adequate calories to and hopefully even increase a kilo or two of body weight leading into the meat or show or whatever. Sorry, I keep sort of referring to specifically powerlifting mostly, but it's just trying to say a little more broadly is when you're trying to drive adaptation, don't expect any favors from your body. Like you've got to stack the odds in your favor. And that means sleep, food, recovery, stress management, all those kind of low hanging fruit that I said at the start, so that you as a coach can worry about the things you need to. Yeah, for sure. And I think uh, finally in terms of like change change of approach in terms of, you know, the powerlifters now, um, you were speaking a lot about, you know, pushing hard, pulling back in distinct periods. Um, I think something that has allowed, uh, you know, athletes to be uh, quite successful Um is the fact that we teach them along the way you know the coach, yeah. the coaching process isn't just here's your plan do it we're very much trying to give them as much of an understanding as they need to about the process and a little bit more just so that they know mm. uh not just how but the why is also and i think that's allowed our clients and athletes to be a lot more autonomous um, and coach themselves, you know, in periods when we're not there quite successfully. And you know, Mia's case was probably an exception uh, to to most of our athletes because, you know, a lot of my guys and girls now in powerlifting, um, you know, I've taught them how to make weight and I barely have to do anything. You know, if they do have to, you know, manipulate food volume, um, you know, fast into the meat, all those kind of things. You know, I had a guy on the weekend, um, Jared, you know, third meet together. Um, you know, he, he, I said to him, what are you weighing? Um, on the Thursday prior, um, he does his weekly check-ins and stuff and he was, you know, a kilo, uh, over, I think it was kilo over or, you know, 900 grams over. And I said, cool, you know what to do. And, you know, he weighed in mm-hmm. at 76.9, so 100 grams under, you know, his, his weight. Um, and that's what allows a coach to, to focus on the important stuff. Uh, not to say that's not important. It's just as your clients go through their career, there are certain things which take precedent to, you know, like making weight and things like that. Um, you know, those kind of uh, issues start to drop down the priority list the more elite somebody gets, you know, unless they're cutting, you know, significant amount of weight to break a record. Uh, that's, a, that's a different kettle of fish. But I think teaching your clients the, the basic skills um, and giving them an education so they can be competent um, with a lot of the, um, for coaches anyway, like superfluous stuff, like the stuff that doesn't really, um, you know, matter too much to us as coaches when working with elite level athletes makes a huge difference because then we don't have to worry about troubleshooting, you know, those little things we can focus more on, you know, the, the big picture stuff, uh, the planning, the execution, um, of the plan and the, you know, the details within the plan, as opposed to, you know, the groundwork, so to speak. And this, this played into our advantage at nationals because, 
you know, a lot of our clients were able to warm up themselves. You know, they, they knew their warm ups, they know how to warm up properly. Um, you know, their rehab, their prehab, their warm up sets. Uh, you know, they understand the process of going in to make weight. You know, I, I didn't go into the weigh in rooms with any of my athletes. You know, they knew how to get mm. their equipment, like basic stuff like that. Um, I think a lot of coaches assume responsibility for and assuming too much responsibility for your clients um, at the start can set an expectation and not teach them those basic competencies. So I'm very big on, you know, when I'm working with a beginner or someone who's just starting out in powerlifting, um, you know, this is how we do it. Next time you're going to do it on your own. So pay attention, Um, you know, so then I can actually worry about the things that I need to. Uh, Whereas I see a lot of coaches, you know, even at the elite level still, you know, babying their clients and athletes and I get it. It's a service and all the rest of it. And they want to make the client feel special and things like that. But at the end of the day, you know, um, I think elite level athletes require a good amount of foundational knowledge about their sport, both, you know, on the platform, game day, competing, um, but also, you know, off season, you know, the prep itself, things like that. And that couldn't be more true for both sports, I don't think. No, I think I think that is a fantastic point you made. Like by doing that, it it requires both knowledge and responsibility from the athlete. And they are two things that just bring about exponentially better results when uh when given in the appropriate amounts um and i've just gone blank on what i was going to say oh that's right um yeah like as a coach you you employ your coach to do the things you can't do not to do everything for you like Mm -hmm. if i even had gen pop clients like the the classic kind of example is the like when they find out it's like you're not going to count my reps for me. Like, what do you do as a personal trainer if you're not going to count my reps? And I'm like, what the fuck are you hiring a personal trainer for just to count reps? Um, like, yeah. And that, and that sort of, that level of analysis applies to, to all levels of competency from, from athletes. It's like, do everything that you can do and your coach will do the things you can't. Mm-hmm. That That's a very simple process. And work at it for a long time and hey presto pretty good results yeah for sure no i couldn't agree more man so guys i think that's a wrap for uh, this episode of the podcast i hope you enjoyed it and i'm sure all of you coaches and self coaches out there uh, would have taken a lot from this and if you do enjoy uh, these in-house episodes, you have questions or topics or things you think uh, you want us to discuss or you want to learn about, uh, feel free to comment in the comments section below. And until next time, thank you, Lyndon, and we'll speak to you all soon. Thanks for having me.